Hi, it's James from CDNFI, and today I'm joined by our guest, Richard Baxter from SEO Gadget. Okay, so um, just tell me a little bit about your background. How did you first get started in SEO, and how, what was the kind of lead up to forming SEO Gadget? Because it's still a relatively new company, isn't it? You've only been going for sort of four years, which I suppose yeah. is quite actually, in four years in internet terms is quite a long term, look long time. <laughs> um, I mean, I suppose it is. Um, the, uh, SEO Gadget is actually a very, very fast growing company. I mean, just in the last year alone, uh, we've grown by about another 100%. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time building all the platform that we need to be able to scale further. We're, we're actually a two and a half million pound turnover group. Uh, which which not a lot of people know, really, because we don't tend to broadcast that fact very often. But it's because of the growth in the San Francisco business as well. Like yeah. we're, we're based over in the US. Uh, but no, in, in terms of how I got into SEO, I, I, most of us have a really weird background when it comes yeah. to that route of entry because there is no well certainly you know 10 years ago there was no specific qualification in search engine optimization you didn't learn this at university i i got into it because um i worked at a a credit card bank after i um left university yeah and um found my found my niche in usability studies we were looking at things like how did users interact with forms for like the credit card sign up and stuff like that sure. and, and that that sort of moved very quickly into me being able to sort of prototype the front end of different web, like types of website and forms and things to you know to to put something in front of a test case that's how we used to do it okay and my next role after I left that job, I went into an e-commerce environment, and it was my job to get the whole website live. They'd been working on this new piece of web development. It was their first e-commerce-enabled uh, website, and it was my job to take it live. So that's what I did. I you know, sourced out all the product pages, the content, got it on the internet finally so people could use it. And the next thing that I encountered was actually a query from the, uh, the CEO of the company, which is, you know, how can we rank in Google? And and at the time, I didn't really know how to answer that question. So I started learning from, uh, you know, just stuff I found on the internet. I started playing around with the meta keywords tag and playing about with all of that stuff until a bit of trial and error then to start off. <laughs> Very with. much so. Yeah. yeah, it was all it was all self taught. I wasn't a full time SEO. I was just playing around with stuff. Um, but eventually, I, you know, as with all of us, I found my way. I found some really nice people in the community that helped me out, and I learned and. And it, and, it, and it really grew from there. I mean, it's quite satisfying to know that the original site, the very first site that I worked on, still ranks quite well, actually. That's for, good, isn't it? Yeah, I know. But they haven't, weirdly, they haven't actually really updated it, which is quite frightening. So it, it looks terrifying now. But uh, that's by the by. I, I then went more into full-time SEO, uh, probably when I moved down to London in about 2006. Yep. Uh, and I uh, worked a lot on things like recruitment industry sites and all of that kind of stuff for a couple of years. Eventually went into the travel industry, which is a really competitive vertical to cut your teeth in. And um, that took me to about 2009 when I, when I decided uh, to start SEO Gadget. Great. Um, so that sounds like you know, kind of a really interesting journey. And I can imagine a lot of people who... Uh, working in SEO or marketing generally have a kind of similar story. I mean, for me, I, I've sort of got some experience with SEO and, and what I found. It's interesting what you said about the, the sort of first or the early sites you worked on still rank. I think that says a lot about SEO in terms of if you do good, honest work and you produce good quality content and, you know, decent site that, you know, you're not trying to sort of trick the search engines or go after the kind of latest tactic or technique to kind of get up there really quickly. Uh, it, it lasts a long time. You know, you get it right from the get go and build a decent site and then, you know, you'll be able to reap the rewards for years to come. Would you kind of agree with that? I completely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, as it, ter- as it turns out, um, I think with the particular verticals that I started out in, um, I was actually quite lucky to not be in a, I was you know I don't think anything was particularly competitive back then yeah. compared to how it is now so there were lots of niches that were quite easy to rank in uh, with just a few citations from you know industry boards and you know if you just got a few citations from a couple of other reasonably relevant and authoritative sites that was enough and that's yeah. actually all I happened to do I mean my, the first site that I worked on was in the building trade and so I just went out and put a couple of links on sites that linked to sites that sold products in the building industry. That was it. That's all it needed. So th- those early sites that I played about with had um, very low levels of what you might have referred to as higher risk styles of link building, right? So things that mm. I think probably by now uh, you might have been seeing a, a penalty for or some kind of filtering happening. That that really wasn't going on with me back then. I didn't need it. It didn't need to happen. And so 
actually what you've got is a lot of sites from from those early days with very natural looking backlink profiles and i think frankly that's that's why they rank perfectly well Absolutely. and you know the obvious dec- disclaimer that i never really did anything that was super high risk uh, but as with all other seos you know you experiment and you do whatever you, is considered to be the best practice uh, default at the time and i've of course seen one or two sites drop and have to be rescued as have we all um, you know having worked in this industry for so long sure so moving on to, kind of to the present day um, mm. there's obviously a lot of changes have been going on over the past couple of years because I think really Google are trying to make almost um, if you want to say I've heard this said before anyway you know Google almost trying to make SEO a non-existent industry if you like and they were trying to push it more in terms of you know content marketing and user engagement um, so they've obviously been introduced lots of new updates We've got Hummingbird coming next year, which I'll ask you about in a minute. But what would you say the sort of the big changes were last year, and you know, how do, what do you predict for 2014? Yeah, it's interesting that you sort of said, yeah, SEO is something that Google, I guess, might prefer not to be there, or at least they're yeah. they're killing it off. And I think I think that S- Google are obviously very big stakeholders in the very definition of SEO, simply of by proxy. You know, their their rules tend to determine how we work. Um which is good, I think, because you know what what they what they're actually doing now is they're creating an environment where it's very hard to do a crap job and be successful. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm actually grateful for that because yeah, that's a good thing. I completely agree with you, you know, because I think the way SEO was a few years ago where you could just go and build a load of really bad quality links is it's not sustainable and it's not really good for anyone. Exactly. Uh, you know, it, it's not good for our industry for that to work. Yeah. The, the worry that I have now, of course, is this: there's this transitionary period where Google have obviously improved very much how they're evaluating uh, the backlink profiles of different types of sites. Their spam detection has got better. It's not perfect by a long way, but it's good. Yep. Um, it's, it, you know, they're, they're a really smart bunch of people, Google, and we know that they're getting more aggressive when it comes down to this kind of thing. So the beautiful thing about that is, is as long as the good guys are doing a good job and they're adding value and they're, you know, they're doing all of these yeah. things that, that kind of satisfy those criteria, it helps to weed out the the bad guys, the guys that give us, on occasion, a bad name. You know, it's, it's my least favorite thing. I speak to a new client. They've worked with an SEO agency before. They've been hurt by that SEO agency. We are then being judged by the same standards, and that's, that's incredibly painful. I think and it's I, just about doing a good for the end user as well as the company that you're trying to help as well. Well, this is the thing. I think, yeah. you know, for, for, certainly from my perspective, relevance is, is, is pretty key. Not, not that, you know, if, you, um, if you're selling coffee mugs, then you need yeah. websites about coffee mugs to link to you. More that, you know, you need genuine, um, high, you know, highish traffic sites with a real audience that have, um, you know, the right types of general interests for any ideas about that particular site to be, uh, to be worth clicking through to and, and visiting and, and you know being being of interest and I think that you know as a discipline we 're being forced down the route of really thinking about the marketing aspects of what we 're doing as in how do we match uh, you know the idea behind this brand our client 's brand and their products and stories about what they do to this particular readership or have I found this audience yet you know the people that are going to be interested in this stuff because I think I think fundamentally, as long as we're going through the process of making sure that we're we're relevant to our target audience, we're not being a bit spammy. We're not just putting weird guest posts up on irrelevant websites about top ten top tens, you know, travel travel apps or whatever it is. Then I th- I think that we'll we're always on the right path. And obviously that process is going to be refined as we become more complex. But Google are encourages encouraging us simply put to be. Uh, more marketing orientated in our day to day, and I, I, I enjoy that because it it keeps me interested in what I do. Okay, great. Um, so, in terms of uh, the hummingbird update, um, give us a bit. You know, anyone who's listening who maybe isn't sure of what hummingbird means, or they maybe have heard of it and, and know a little bit, what does it really mean for for webmasters? Well, I mean, actually, I think it it it, it means a lot less for webmasters than it does for users of Google in this case. I mean, so many of the previous, in fact, nearly all of the previous updates that Google have put out so famously yeah. tend to affect your day-to-day as an SEO, don't they? You know, you know we've, got to, we've got to improve the uniqueness of the copy on our web pages and, and, and get rid of duplicate content, or we've got to improve our backlink profile because Google doesn't like it. You know, suddenly Hummingbird comes along, yeah. and actually it's, it's an improvement for, the, uh, for, for, for their users in that um, 
it's, it's, it's an infrastructure update that better enables them to serve uh, certainly more relevant results via the uh, interpretation of a search query. So they're, I guess they're a little bit more able to understand what a user really might hope to see by executing that particular search query. And I mean, it's incredibly clever the way they do all of this sort of, sort of thing. So it's, you know, large infra infrastructure update with a lot of uh, artificial intelligence to understand the very nature of search queries coupled with a better understanding of entity search. So, you know, uh, what, does the fr what does the word San Francisco actually mean? I mean, you and I know that it's a city, uh, but the, the, the processing power that you need to be able to understand uh, whether or not a user meant San Francisco as a city or, you know, and, and, and are, they, are they looking for something that's local to San Francisco because they're in San Francisco when they search for that query or are they more interested in tourism guides and travel guides because they're executing that search from outside of San Francisco. All of these kinds of data points are the sort of things uh, that I, I imagine Google are very, very interested in understanding when they're trying to construct search results that are a lot more relevant to their users. Yeah, so um, in layman's terms then, it's basically about Google uh, kind of relating to people, like, more, more, almost like, more like as humans, whereas before, to get really relevant search results even, I mean, it's not been, it's been, not been this bad for a few years ago. I remember when I f sort of first got started online, you'd have to be really, really careful about how you're constructing your search queries, and it, you almost had to be a bit technical about how you went about it to kind of get the results you wanted sometimes, whereas now, it's kind of just, you can type in pretty much whatever you're thinking, and it will, it will get that. Well, I hope so, and I mean, yeah. you know, I think as they, as they get smarter, um, you know, and, and head down that type of route, there are people who search for very technical, very long tail things that you might hear complaining at you because they've dumbed down their results a little bit. But I think for the most part, this is obviously to accommodate changes. Uh, the growing popularity of stuff like voice search and on the one hand they've got to understand what that person said but the very nature of the search query itself is going to be a lot more human it's going to be a lot more conversational yeah. uh, and therefore are they able to actually process the meaning of that search query and deliver results that make any sense at all I think they're good at it I don't think that they're good enough at it so I'm hoping that uh, as time goes on um, you know we'll they'll get us there but in any case you know the question was really how does it affect webmasters and it's, it's quite hard to say how it affects webmasters. I mean, I think the bottom line is that you, you've, you've got to be doing a lot of the same stuff that we're doing already, first of all. So, okay. look, you, you, you've still got to build a website that is optimized to, uh, you know, technical best practices. We've got to have, mm. um, you know, all of that new stuff that they've given us to play with in place. So things like schema. Org. We've got to have implemented authorship. We need to be using the Open Graph protocol, and we need, you know, probably to put in Twitter card and things like that. All of the, all of those little snippets of information that help search engines and social networks better understand uh, the information that's contained on the page. And obviously, with things like technical best practices, like dealing with duplicate content and making sure that you're uh, you're not hammering away at bandwidth unnecessarily because you've got lots of uh, lots of indexed URLs that you don't want in there anymore. You know, so things that you might discover through log file analysis. I think it's really important to still have all of that, simply because you know, while we're talking about Hummingbird, mm. we know that updates like Panda are still there and they're more aggressive now than they ever were before. So we have to have this well-optimized site, and I think that we need to be able to understand very much that the content on the site needs to be built around uh, what we understand about the needs of our users. So it's not good enough simply to have lots and lots of dynamic pages that are optimized for single keywords, maybe with product listings on them and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that you would expect uh, large websites to have been successful four or five years ago obviously isn't going to wash now. Um, our users are smarter than that and obviously Google's smarter than that. So I really love the idea of telling, you know, webmasters and marketers alike to work to the idea of understanding uh, the problems that their everyday users face and create content around those problems. I mean, we're working with uh, an accounting company at the moment, a company that sells accounting software. Yeah. And, and they're very, very focused on uh, rankings for the very technical terms. They want to know that they can help people build a profit and loss or a, or a balance sheet or an income statement and things like that. And no, actually, the majority of their users are first-time entrepreneurs. You know, they've, they've never come across a balance sheet before. They probably don't know how to build one. What they really want to understand is, you know, how do I start a business or when will I have to pay my corporation tax on my first year's profit? Those longer tail queries that actually uh, are easy to answer factually uh, in a unique and useful way, uh, but actually 
actually a lot of businesses don't really think about. So if anything, I think Hummingbird is going to make us go back to the drawing board a little bit on understanding the intention of uh, our target market, our clients, users, and really building content that solves problems for them and really helps them um, yeah, find the answer yeah. to the problem that they're looking for. Yeah, I think that sounds like really good advice. And I think you know, for anyone who's sort of looks, looking to get going uh, in SEO, um, it gives them a lot of uh, lot of things to think about. And I think actually, people, you know, when they're starting a business now, obviously the website is really important. But you've got to have a content strategy in place, which kind of moves me on to my next question. Mm. Um, uh, so, with content marketing, are they kind of like? SEO versus content marketing. I know content marketing, I, I mean, I went to a, an e-commerce uh, sort of expo um, last year and I noticed that a lot of the exhibitors there, you know, if, maybe if you went to a, a, a sort of place like that, you know, an expedition of about five years ago, you'd see lots of SEO companies, but there were a lot of companies that were billing themselves as content marketing companies. Mm. So what are the differences, if there are any, between SEO and content marketing now? And, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, like... <sighs> Content marketing is a really huge discipline in its own right. It's it's been around for a long time, as as as, as to an extent, um, quite a separate topic. You know, yeah. you were saying like a couple of years ago, uh, there were organisations in content marketing that barely understood SEO at all. Of course, they're going to know it's there, but they it, it's not in their day to day, and that simply simply put that you know that they were creating content to solve the problems of you know potential users of their of their of their websites and we yeah. we talked about that a moment ago but but SEO is obviously latched on to content marketing as a highly desirable skill um, yes. I, I think I think content marketing is complementary to the goal of SEO in the you know SEO people are there to grow traffic and revenue for their client sites or their own sites and more and more we're measured on things like revenue as a KPI and so we should be you know we've got to be able to make sure that our outcomes are measurable and relevant to the the nature of the businesses that we're working on as is content marketing I mean the bottom line is we we, we can produce content that converts without a doubt we've, we've seen it happen before um, we had a really interesting case study from about a year ago where we, we produced an interactive infographic uh, that talked about a very specific specific topic in travel um, and that, that that interactive assisted uh, for two months straight it generated more revenue than their affiliate and email marketing channels put together I think it, 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 it came in at something like ten times the net revenue in terms of the cost of implementing that piece of work versus what it made back in profit now that the discipline that you need to be able to come up with something like that I think is very much content marketing's uh, it, it's very much come from content marketing's sphere in that you're looking at the needs of your target audience you're identifying the problems that they have and then you're creating a piece of content to solve that problem and if you're doing it right and if the content itself is entirely relevant to the nature of the business i.e. it speaks to the right people then of course with the right call to action you're going to generate some revenue so I, I really think that content marketing is a skill that SEO people can acquire I think that they they need to they need to respect the fact that it's a big and complex discipline and it's not something that we can simply play pay lip service to you've got to study it if you want it but I'd, I would argue that it's a totally necessary skill I think that as SEO evolves for us we've got to understand the art of earning links and earning social traction on our sites the best way to do that in fact the only way I can think of to do that right now is to build a really compelling experience for our users on that website the best route to that is of course by creating the right content for them yeah. therefore content marketing it's benefiting the user as well as uh, also benefiting your search strategy um, yes so tell us a little bit because I mean we've uh, had a great website on uh, seogadget.com and there's lots of useful tools which you put up there I guess as part of your marketing and your content strategy, but they're you know genuinely good tools. So, one that's caught our eye is your strategy, content strategy generator. Um, yeah. So tell us a bit about this, you know, and who who it can help and and how to use it. Well, um, I mean, so first of all, it, it can help anybody who has an interest in what various sort of social content aggregation sites might be featuring in terms of emerging or interesting content mm. around a particular topic. So I think, um, I think that the default search query in the content strategy generator tool is hotels. And so it will come up with you know, whatever content, be it in the article or in the article title, might be popular and surfacing on the web to do with that topic within, within, within of course, the confines of the sites that we currently scrape. 
yeah. to get that data. I mean, fundamentally, the, the original version of this tool was an internal tool. Uh, we just wanted to be able to use something that took a snapshot of what was popular um, when we were planning content strategy for our clients. And I mean, this was probably almost coming up to three years ago. We built this quite early on. A uh, bit of an exercise in XPath, you know, so uh, Dan, who, who built it, our yeah. head of SEO, uh, he got very interested in being able to fetch data in Google Docs from the web using XPath, as was the, uh, as was the, uh, the, the fashion back then before we started coding things in, 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 in Python and PHP. Mm. But anyway, he built this thing. We loved it. Everybody used it. He updated it to uh, V2. And at some point in that process, we put it on a blog post and everybody kind of went crazy over it. My, my biggest problem with it now is that we've got, uh, we've got a V3 and we've been sat on V3 for ages. It's brilliant. And I'm just really trying to get Dan to push the V3 version out. Um, I, I think a little bit of pressure from everybody would be yeah, really definitely. welcome because <laughs> it's, it's a really good piece of kit. It's definitely one of the most uh, popular pages on our site. Of course, it's not the only tool that we've got, uh, but it is a popular one because people can take it, make a copy of it, uh, you know, adjust it for their own purposes and, and play about with it. And it's a good way to learn XPath as well, which is uh, um, a good skill to have if you're interested in uh, SEO. I guess in uh, XPath, I suppose it's one of those things, you know, Google Docs can be incredibly powerful because I watched um, a kind of a tutorial series on this. I've never actually used it myself, but I've seen it mm. done. And it's one of those things that you can just do, you can make, it's almost like a Swiss army knife, so you can do all kinds of really quirky and interesting things really quickly without like, kind of learning a programming language, I guess, uh, in terms of like pulling in data from different sources and, you know, having different parts of Google Docs talk to other parts and all sorts of stuff like that, so it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I think also another point to make is <clears throat> if you're building little tools like that for your market, whether you're, you know, selling SEO or selling a CDN or selling whatever, they are actually really, really good to build leads, aren't they? Because you're actually providing something of genuine value to, to your audience. And as a result, you know, you kind of build up a good bit of goodwill in the marketplace, which never hurts anyone. And, um, yeah. you know, it's genuinely it's, it's great because you kind of you meet some interesting people sometimes. And it's great to, as I say, build, a, build your customer list and kind of, uh, you know, get inquiries through the door. I think what we've, what we've learned over time is that having, I mean, yeah, obviously having tools on the site is... It's really good for us, particularly in our peer community. Yeah. So lots and lots of SEOs out there, and um, you know, frequently they consider using SEO Gadget for Excel, our Excel extension that talks to services like Majestic or right. uh, the Content Strategy Generator or the Embed Code Generator. You know, over time we've built a handful of you know very useful little tools that solve a problem for an SEO that obviously we've encountered in the past and that they, they like our solution above someone else's and that's a good thing because yeah you know they, they link to us when they write about us in their blog posts and they they share us on Twitter and they you know they do all of those cool things and that's that's wonderful for us to uh, establish some credibility with that immediate audience and and that's been the mainstay of SEO gadgets growth really for you know certainly the last few years um it's interesting to look at how that translates to a very typical customer of seo gadget at the moment for the most part most of our clients tend to have in-house seo teams uh, they have they have skills for sure they're talented and bright people yeah they bring they bring us in because they're aware of us they're aware of us probably through our tools or they've seen us speaking at a conference and they know that we might know something that they want to learn more about and therefore they, they use us for a campaign. Okay. Having, having tools on your site definitely can attract people very much like you, that's for sure. Yes, we're absolutely. And that's a good thing. That it, it's only part, though, I think, of, of probably a more mature technical marketing strategy in that you know, we, we need to have something that probably translates more complex ideas into simpler ideas for the uh, more mainstream marketing community, you know, like things like guides, white papers, and all of that kind of thing. And that's, that's very much my job now is to help um, you know, perhaps more mainstream marketers, non-specialists, understand what SEO is, be able to evaluate the good from the bad, particularly in light of the conversation we were just happen ha having about bad SEO, and uh, obviously for them to be become more aware of our brand as as one of the companies that that, that does this job and and so that's that's kind of much more what i'm focusing on now where my uh, my technical seo team still gets to play about with the tools and do all the fun stuff sure. lucky them <laughs> yeah all right so to finish up then um i just want to talk about speed and how that's important as an seo uh, strategy and also i guess how a kind of a cdn can link in with that because obviously you've um, one of the reasons we're talking to you is because you've recently become a CDNFI customer and yeah. uh, you've had some, some good results with that, I understand. 
I have, yes, indeed. And in fact, I sent you, uh, I sent you a link to a screenshot of our analytics on site speed. Uh, okay. And genuinely, I, I mean, I was, I was. This is the first time I've, I've looked at it. I knew that it was a lot quicker in the U.S. because I'd asked mm. uh, our team over there. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're looking about forty percent quicker on page load uh, mm. in the USA, um, and actually we've got a twenty percent improvement in the U.K. And I think that the U.K. improvement is actually most impressive because we were on. Uh, super fast hosting anyway uh, so that's really exciting to see mm. but yeah the, uh, I implemented this because I knew that we were kind of we were looking a little bit slower in the USA obviously that's actually a bigger uh, traffic source for us over there I think probably 60% of all of our traffic comes from the USA mm. um, and it's I've seen it loading slowly over there it's it's painful to watch especially because uh, you know for now the, the, uh, as the version of the site we're on um, you know hits its sort of sunset weeks we're about to replace it but yeah. you know it is it is quite a slow heavy loader and so we needed something to to solve that problem now from an seo perspective mm. um there's lots of conjecture on the fact that actually a faster website is a higher ranking website if all other factors are uh, uh, uh you know uh, are left out you know it's it's i think it's fair to say that over time if you've got a very slow website Therefore, lots of people clicking a result and then suddenly returning to the search results because you didn't load in time or you took ages, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be a negative ranking factor. And I think uh, Google have been a lot more explicit about how they're evaluating sites this year because of the importance of mobile results and mobile search. And generally speaking, you know, listen, if you, if you can't even master the art of getting a website to load quickly on desktop, what chance do you have on mobile? Um, yeah. And so, you know... We also know, actually, that, yeah, of course, the, um, an improvement in, in page load speed um, tends to be very proportional to things like conversion rate or the average number of uh, page views per visit and things like that. And of course, we, wa yeah. we, we want people who are very click-happy and obviously very purchase-happy on our websites. That's definitely really? a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so that's why we use CDNs. That's why we recommend CDNs to all of our customers. Um, it's why SEO Gadget's on the CDN. That and... You know, normally I find the process of setting up a CDN technically quite interesting because it's not always easy. But actually, you guys were a bit too easy. The, it just worked straight away. I can believe it. So uh, um, that's great to know. Actually, uh, it, yeah. it, it, it is. It is a good thing. Um, it, I do like a technical challenge sometimes or a bit of a head scratcher. But actually, it just worked. So um, it's great, and that's why we're using CDNify. Cool. Well, thanks very much for, for that. Um, so finally, just to sort of finish up with what's next for SEO Gadget, what are your kind of plans <laughs> and aims for this year? I hear that you're hiring as well. Yeah, we're, um, we're hiring like lunatics at the moment. So we've got um, something like 18 positions available in the UK team. Wow. Um, a good three or four positions over the next few months with the US team as well. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned we've, we've got a new website that's due in about a month's time, something like that. Um, and we've, we've been building a lot of sort of front-end web development projects for our clients. So things like interactive uh, infographics and um, guides that are based in sort of HTML and have interactive elements. Um, frustratingly, we're, we're not always able to put those guides or the case study for those guides up on our sites, you know, because of contracts and things like that. Same for every other SEO agency too. So what we've done is we've actually built our own portfolio of live interactive infographics on top of our responsive CSS framework, which is called Open Doors. Mm. So we're, we're just launching something that's much more representative of what we're able to do today and, and hopefully it'll be a learning experience as well for our visitors we're going to be writing about how we build these kinds of things uh, so we're moving away from just pure you know technical seo blog posts and really hardcore stuff to things a bit more creative too so that's why we're hiring creative people always we've got great front-end developers and designers we're looking for more of those uh, but of course we need lots and lots of seo people too uh, we've just signed a contract on a new office so we're about to move into a space uh, that's going to have something like 75 seats available uh, over five floors so yes we're, we're growing uh, yep. that's my job to get us to grow and um, i'm really looking forward to the year ahead great i mean I, I am too and i can't wait to see where seo gadget goes so thanks very much richard baxter for talking to us today here at cdnfi and um, we'll catch up soon thank you all right bye for now